Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. They try to run their states rationally, efficiently, profitably. They encourage trade, develop bureaucracy, and were the patrons of great philosophers. And they spent much of their time at war fighting one another. The enlightened despots, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. Throughout history you can find the correspondence between political power and economic prosperity. As a rule, at least in relation to their size, the most economically advanced countries tend to be maritime powers. In the ancient world this was true of the Phoenicians, the Greeks, the Romans, and in the 17th century, in the 18th century, it would be true about the Dutch, the English, and the French. Now this is especially understandable when you consider what travel was like in the pre-modern world, difficult and slow. Water was by far the best highway. Now let me give you an example that's only 300 years old. In 1698, the estates, that is the parliament of Burgundy, voted money to buy a large bronze statue of Louis XIV. And the statue was cast in Paris, then it was brought by river to Auxerre, and from there it set off to Dijon, the capital of Burgundy, to Dijon by land, about a hundred miles away. But it got stuck in the mud and it had to be kept in a shed for 21 years until the road was good enough to bear it. Given that land transport was in such a parlous state, and bear in mind that France probably had the best roads in Europe, water transport was much better. Rivers were useful, but rivers had problems. They had rapids, they had sandbanks and shallows, and the water level went up and down, and they also had tolls, which could make even a short journey expensive. The sea, however, was a river without rapids or shallows or tolls, and ships could travel far and fast on it, carrying more cargo and more people than any river barge could. The Italian city-states in the Renaissance, Spain and Portugal in the 16th century, Holland, Britain, France in the 17th, all demonstrated that easy access to water meant trade, which meant prosperity, which meant power. And to lose access meant strangulation. In 1571, the loss of Cyprus to the Turks sealed the decline of Venice. In 1588, the English defeat of the Spanish Armada began the naval decline of Spain. And half a century after that, English fleets began to defeat the Dutch, who had previously ruled the high seas, and that was the beginning of English ascendancy. So it's a good idea to keep your eye on what happens at sea. Now the connection between wealth and naval power, between overseas trade and prosperity, had also struck the rulers of countries in East and Central Europe that didn't have access to the ocean. One can describe much of their activity in the 17th and especially in the 18th century 
as a struggle to get to the sea and on it and across it. Russia drove towards the Black Sea and the Baltic. Prussia, which had Baltic ports, tried to start trading companies to sail the high seas. And the Austrians tried to revive Antwerp, although they didn't succeed because the Dutch wouldn't let them. Instead, they created a new port at the top of the Adriatic, Trieste, which would remain Austria's chief naval base into the 20th century. None of these enterprises was very successful, however, because continental powers had to concentrate on fighting various wars in Europe. So even though wealth and power depended on naval activity, security, and greed still fo focused on land warfare. And yet the new pragmatic business mentality was gaining ground even on land, serving to moderate the enormous destructiveness of land warfare. Devastation, after all, is bad for business. And this attitude was something new. For thousands of years, Warfare was more than just battles. It was the devastation of enemy land. When two Greek cities went to war, the first thing they did was to ravage the fields and orchards of the opponent. When Louis XIV fought the Habsburgs 2,300 years later, his troops burnt and ravaged the Rhineland so badly that they were still remembered in the 20th century. The pretty town of Heidelberg in the Neckar Valley was almost completely destroyed by the French in 1689 and again in 1693. What you see in Heidelberg today has almost all been built in the 18th century, except for the castle whose ruins still stand on the hill above the town. But in the 18th century, Rulers and their generals started to try to keep war away from civilians. War became an exercise for soldiers, campaigns were decided by set-piece battles and even more by sophisticated maneuvers. Who could outflank whom? Who could get the best positions? Armies which had always lived off the land also began to operate as self-contained units with their own supply trains and stores and field kitchens. This development was in part a revulsion against the bloodshed and destruction of 17th century warfare. But it was also part of a more rational approach to war. War was coming to be regarded as being more about gain than about destruction. If you approach war as logically as you approach business, you keep destruction to a minimum, you minimize incidental losses, and you don't destroy civilians or civilian property, civilian productivity, because famine and ruins are bad for the economy, and you don't want to destroy wealth, just win it. Nevertheless, like every other century, the 18th century had its wars, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, where states were still establishing firm borders at each other's expense. This is when the great realm of Russia became a European power, under the rule of Peter the Great, and later under the rule of Catherine the Great. This is when a poor marginal state in North Germany turned into the Kingdom of Prussia. It forged ahead under the guidance of Frederick William I, who thought the best investment was an army. And under his son, Frederick the Great, a brilliant general who cashed the dividends on his father's investment. And this is also when the Austrian Habsburgs rolled back the Turks and affirmed their hold on Central and Southeast Europe under the guidance of a remarkable woman, Maria Theresa, the Archduchess of Austria and Queen of Hungary and Bohemia, 
and later under her son Joseph II. The wars in Central and Eastern Europe that made all this possible were important because they set the shape of the region for 150 years. And they affected everybody else, the English, the French, the Swedes, the Dutch, because when one power became too strong, the others would intervene against it, which was the beginning of the system of a balance of power. The Poles were especially affected by these wars because Russia and Prussia and Austria tended to settle their differences at the expense of their large divided kingdom. By 1795, Poland was carved up among the three powers. But if you take your eyes off the map of Europe, you will find that the 18th century wars were not really about Europe, but about world dominion and world trade. The French, English, Spanish, Dutch were really fighting about who was going to get the Spanish trade and Spanish possessions in the Americas, about what was going to happen to French possessions in America and India and about the fate of British colonies in North America. And so the scale of European politics had exploded and wars were no longer primarily about family politics, they were about trade and profit. But the continental rulers in Central and Eastern Europe and other rulers who didn't have competitive navies could not participate in these great oceanic contests, and so instead they tried to make their realms more efficient, more rational, more productive. They tried to generate by internal reform what they couldn't get from overseas trade. And this was the origin of what we describe as enlightened despotism. Would-be enlightened despots were to be found in Naples and Tuscany, Spain and Portugal, Prussia and Austria, Russia, Scandinavia, all trying to run their states rationally, efficiently and profitably. The typical enlightened autocrat was Frederick II, King of Prussia from 1740 to 1786. Frederick was a patron of Voltaire. He liked to describe himself as the first servant of his people. He wrote several books explaining that statesmanship should be founded on virtue and justice and responsibility. And he spent much of his reign breaking his word, making war, enlarging the territories he had inherited. Men like Frederick were supposed to be enlightened because they tried to go about their business more rationally than their predecessors. They were interested in revenue. They knew that revenue was higher when production and exchange were more intense. And since they couldn't get to the sea and exploit it, they tried to develop the economy in other ways. They rationalized government administration, they introduced a census of the population which could be used for taxing citizens and to draft men into the army. They surveyed lands to know just what properties were worth. They named streets and numbered the houses in order to make identification and accounting easier. And they developed the bureaucracy and trained bureaucrats to work more efficiently. The spirit of the new bureaucrats was completely secular. They had no preconceptions and they would try anything provided it worked. Everybody and everything was grist to their mill and grist to their will. And one result of this attitude was that just as in the older trading cities, bureaucrats were not interested in religious conformity. Religion was simply one factor in their political calculation. 
rulers might well be practicing Christians, but politically they would tolerate any kind of worship that didn't trouble the public order and that contributed to public wealth. One result of this was that the 18th century turns out to be a great age of prosperous refugees settling in other more pragmatic countries. Catholics from Ireland fleeing English rule, supporters of the exiled Stuarts getting out of Scotland, and Huguenots leaving France after Louis XIV abolished the Edict of Nantes and began a new wave of persecutions. The Huguenot emigration was going to give England the actor David Garrick in the 18th century, Cardinal Newman in the 19th century, and in the 20th, Winston Churchill, whose mother's family had emigrated to America from France. The Irish filled Europe with soldiers of fortune and they were going to provide France with two presidents, General MacMahon in the 19th century and General de Gaulle in the 20th. Even the great Duke of Wellington had an Irish grandfather, although Wellington himself always denied uh, he was Irish. A man, he said, is not a horse because he was born in a stable. But the bureaucracy went beyond religious tolerance. The same practical reasons that made the state relatively tolerant or really indifferent to religious issues. This also suggested that the state attacked the church insofar as the church might aspire to operate as an independent entity. The state, after all, had to dominate and control everything in its ken. It attacked the church in order to get the church's money or its property and to put them to more productive uses. It put pressure on the church to carry out the church's social obligations, to operate as an effective machine for charity or as an effective representative of the central government. And it attacked the church in order to abolish or to limit ecclesiastical censorship and to improve education. The new states were interested in the church insofar as it could contribute to their plans. Joseph II of Austria, for example, regarded parish priests as salaried state officials whose duty it was to cooperate with police in the service of the state. So in their quest for education, efficiency, rationalism, these new bureaucratic states relied on anybody who would help them, skilled professionals, teachers, writers, and scientists, mostly from Western Europe. And it was to impress and attract this educated and highly influential minority that some of the Central and East European princes removed censorship and introduced a certain freedom of the press in their dominion. They wanted to impress the Westerners, and they also wanted to copy them because Western practices and ideas, especially English and French ideas, were connected with other Western superiorities in technology, weaponry, productivity. What Frederick of Prussia and Joseph of Austria wanted most was a well-ordered state a population that was prosperous, educated, satisfied because it lived under efficient government and under wise laws that were consistently administered by royal justice, not capriciously by nobles on their estates. They wanted cities growing with industry, fattened by production and profit, and above all, they wanted regular taxes, efficiently collected from everybody, coming in regularly, reliably, to pay for the state machinery and for a large, well-trained, well-equipped army. <laughs> 
But that was exactly what they didn't have. And to get it would require a social revolution to change things from what they actually were to what they should be and to change them quickly because they didn't have time to sit around and wait. But you also have to bear in mind that the last thing they wanted was a real social revolution. Frederick and Joseph and the others wanted the social hierarchy to go on just as before. They wanted the nobles muzzled and tamed, but they did not want to turn society upside down. They wanted it to function efficiently for their benefit, for the benefit of the state and of its absolute ruler, and that was it. But in Prussia and Hungary, the nobles wouldn't stand for reforms. In Belgium, the middle class objected and rioted. In other countries, the middle class was too weak to help and hence useless. In the Catholic countries and in Russia, the local church protested. In Transylvania and Bohemia, the peasants revolted. And elsewhere, they either couldn't help or when they tried, they weren't wanted. At an impasse, the reforming princes found their main allies in a group of men whom you would not at first expect to support them, the philosophers of the Enlightenment. Men like Diderot, Voltaire, Hume, Bentham, and Kant. At the end of the 17th century, the first dictionary of the French Academy defined the philosophe, the philosopher, as a student of the sciences, a wise man who lives a quiet life, and or a man who by free thought puts himself above the ordinary duties and obligations of civil life. You must not think of the philosophe as what we today call philosophers, professional hair splitters, logicians, semanticists. The 18th century philosopher was what we might today describe as a sociologist, in the sense that he studied society with an eye on the possibilities of social reform. Above all, he or she was a free thinker, at least in the sense that they were hostile to the commonly accepted version of revealed religion, and that's how you might best think of the philosophes as free thinkers and social critics. In their own minds, however, the philosophes were above all rationalists, people who, as Immanuel Kant put it, dared to know people who were determined to imbue the world with a consciousness of the rights and the powers of human intelligence. Their point of view had been shaped by the science of Isaac Newton, who taught that all nature is founded in universal law and that its regularities can be understood and mastered by the human mind. And it was shaped by the psychology of John Locke, who taught that the faculty of reasoning seldom or never deceives those who trust in it, and that men are reasonable beings, capable of using their own knowledge and intelligence for the promotion of their own happiness. All this being so, the philosophes believe that if you want to make men happy and perfect, all you have to do is enlighten them. And their ideas of enlightenment came curiously close to those of the reforming princes. The philosophes, like the princes, wanted order, prosperity, tolerance, education, and justice fairly administered. They thought the church was one of the main obstacles to all this. They thought that the middle class as a source of prosperity and enlightenment should be encouraged and its interests favored. They thought that aristocratic privilege was unjustified by reason and ought to be ended. 
so that advancement should be open to talent and capacity, and taxes should be paid by all. They knew exactly what reforms were necessary to bring about the good society, and they had talked about it, they had written about it for years to persuade their fellow citizens, and it hadn't done a bit of good. So what they wanted now were philosopher kings, enlightened despots, and they saw them not in the West where established society was impossible to move, but in Central and Eastern and Southern Europe, where new lands were ready to be molded into perfection, or so they thought. We shall see just how enlightened these enlightened despots were in our next program. Until then. <laughs>